Well, it's minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside this morning, which is minus 23 Celsius. And this is my favorite type of running in the winter. This means the snow is nice and cold. It's going to be hard pack and it's going to be great running. But the problem with that is when I'm doing these videos, taking the GoPro outside in that temperature, it severely cuts into the battery really quickly. So we're going to dive into some shoe talk inside before I head out so I can save part of my battery because I know how much you guys want to hear about shoes. And then we're going to head out and I'm going to run south of town. One of my athletes told me that they're putting in a new snow track for fat biking and running. And I want to go check it out because today's the, going to be the perfect day. The sun's going to come out and it should be really, really good snow conditions. So I want to check out this new trail. I'm going to take you guys down there. Um, and while we're out running, we're going to talk about speed development and how that comes into play with any type of running. But I'm going to use a case study with one of my athletes of developing speed first and then applying it to his ultra training for his ultra running. I know you guys have a lot of questions about how to sequence speed. We're going to dive into that a little bit using my athlete Zach as an example. So here we go. Let's talk shoes. First of all, um, last week I put a post out for your questions. I wanted to thank everybody for their great questions and I'll be handpicking those and doing some longer outside videos, really doing a deep dive into a lot of those questions. So thanks for sending those. But with that, I always get a lot of shoe questions and it's really kind of tough to answer specific questions based on the person asking them, not knowing exactly their situation with their strength, with their form, with the type of running they do. So what I wanna do is with a lot of the videos going forward, always have a shoe component of discussing what shoe I'm using and why I'm using it that day, that then that can help you maybe understand my philosophy of why I'm doing something on any given day that may then help you with your running because everybody is so different. So let's dive into today. Like I mentioned, it's really cold out, minus 10 Fahrenheit, minus 23 Celsius. And I am headed south of my home to some new trails that are being put in with um, a grooming machine for snow biking. And this is quite a thing out here in Jackson. We have lots of groomed trails on snow in the trails in town that allow for great snow biking and great running. And a lot of times because they are so groomed and we stay so cold, it's really, really good running. It's not icy. It's wonderful snow. And sometimes in the winter, the trails are much faster than in the summer because all the rock and technical terrain are hidden and you can run actually a little bit faster. Anyways, so that, that comes down to my shoe choice today. Like I said, I'm headed out the door from home. I'm gonna encounter bike path south until I hit these new trails, which will then be on snow. And in between, on the bike path, I'm gonna encounter just pure pavement slash tarmac that has been melted. And I'm gonna also encounter some snow and maybe a little bit of ice. So typically during the winter, I use a very, very minimal shoe to um, just kind of run in a natural environment. With the snow, you know, I, I just don't need a lot of a shoe for the type of running that I can do during the winter. So that's my time where I go really, really natural, really, really flexible and use that as a time for um, preparing my legs, my feet, my body to go as minimal as possible once the mountain trails open up in the summer. So my goal from a shoe standpoint is always to be able to put myself 
in a very, very minimal or natural, flexible environment a lot of the time. So then when I need more of a shoe for protection in the mountains, very, we have very, very technical mountains here. So I need lots of protection, but my feet and my legs want to be in a natural shoe because I've developed that, that conditioning to allow me to really run as, as natural as possible. So my feet seek out and I always want to be as, as flexible and natural as a shoe as possible, but also give me the protection that I need for the mountains. Say so. My goal is always to be as natural as possible for the mountains. And running in a, a very natural, flexible shoe a lot of the time will allow me then to go into more of a minimal or natural shoe most of the time in the mountains. That might be considered a industry minimal shoe. Most people, most ultra runners, most mountain runners would consider what I use all day in the mountains as a very, very minimal shoe. But for me, since I'm used to wearing such a flexible shoe a lot of the times for most of my runs, that other industry standard minimal shoe feels more built up to me. It gives me the protection I need but I still get the properties of a natural environment, which, which I like. And so today I'm going to use this shoe. It's going to give me a good variety of ability on hard tarmac, which is going to be really hard because of how cold it is on a little bit of ice and a snow. Whereas if I wore this, Hey, the, the lugs aren't as good for a lot of snow and it just is not as versatile as, as this shoe is going to be today. And so it's still very flexible. Again, this is what an industry standard minimal shoe for most ultra runners would be. This is, this is meant for up to maybe two hours where I can now run in this all day anywhere I want. And I still get the properties of using a nice flexible, very natural type of shoe for my feet. So that's my philosophy always is that try to get into as most natural environment as possible with my shoes, but that also gives me the protection I need based on how long I'm going and where I'm going in the mountains. And so I'm always kind of working, working two systems going on here. Okay. So that's the shoe of choice today The innovate, this is the old Terra Ultra G270. They have now changed the name to the Innovate Trailfly G270, which version two is coming out and I should be able to review here in the next three to four weeks. So look for that. Um, again, very, very flexible. Um, but for me, this feels like much more of a built up shoe based on what I'm normally using most of the time. That's the key for me. All right, let's bundle up and head outside. All right, you're just going to see just how beautiful cold, cold winter running can be. It's just going to be beautiful today. And you can see those mountains into clouds back there. That's my summertime access to trails right outside the door. So home is right there literally half a mile away and here's here's our bike path condition so far it's going to be kind of like hit or miss like this all the way i think but we're headed south towards the sun but let's talk about zach like i mentioned we're going to talk about today speed development and how i strategically worked one of my new athletes and let's talk about zach Zach lives in California. Zach is an adaptive athlete. He was, uh, he was born um, missing above the knee on his right leg. And he is on a mission to help other, adapt other adaptive athletes get into trail running and 
he's established his foundation called Born to Adapt. So I'm coaching him this year to UTMB, which if you're not familiar with UTMB, it's 100 miles in the Europe Alps, goes through Switzerland, France, and Italy. He went last year, this is our first year of coaching, he went last year, wasn't able to finish. Look at clouds just starting to kind of burn off. It's gonna be pretty spectacular. He wasn't able to make the cutoffs. And I told him, hey, you're just not fast enough right now. You have the endurance, you have the strength. We just need to get you faster. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. With all the foot tracks, you can also see the fat bike tracks. All these fat bikers are headed down to this, check out this trail that we're gonna go check out. And that canyon back there behind me, that's one of the more common canyons I run in the summertime. It's, again, it's about a two mile trail run to the canyon and I can go up the back of these mountains and hit his, run as long as I want to. There's a couple peaks back there, you can go up to um, a pretty high alpine environment. So everything's just right outside the back door with the, the Grand Tetons further north, about 20 miles. All right, we're headed to our junction and hopefully that new trail is going to be somewhere around here. Maybe right here. Let's see. Found it. Here it is. You can see all the fat bike travel. And looks like I'm gonna be the first foot on it today. That's how cold it is. All right, let's run this sucker. Pretty nice. All right, back to Zach. Common mistake I see ultra runners make and even marathoners is that if they're trying to either look to finish cutoff times or improve their overall ultra ability or make Boston qualifying times or just improve their marathon in general, the common mistake is to keep layering on endurance, more volume, longer runs, more running, but if you're further away from your goal from a speed perspective, you need to develop speed first and then apply that to your endurance training relative to your ultra distance or your marathon. And that's what we're doing with Zach. We just got an email this morning from a runner looking for some coaching and he wants to do the world major marathons, all of them starting with New York Marathon this fall. He wants to Boston qualify at New York. First question I asked him was, well, where, where's your speed at? How far are we away from your Boston qualifying time? Because we may need to do some speed development first before we start marathon training. With Zach, we're three months into his speed development training and he's headed to New Zealand to do Tarawira Ultra. And our goal, up to this point was to improve his speed and he just did his second one mile test yesterday and he improved his one mile time by 70 seconds that's a whopping improvement and if we put that into marathon context that's like improving his marathon potential by over 30 minutes just by improving his one mile time in the speed development phase that we went through now that doesn't mean he's gonna necessarily get to run a marathon 30 minutes faster, we still knew to apply appropriate training to that endurance to make that happen. But that's why I used the word potential. Now his speed is up to the potential of improving his marathon time by 30 minutes. And so that's the goal for his ultra marathoning development. We needed to get him faster before he could even think about finishing UTMB because he's just not fast enough. 
his slow, appropriate level of effort on the Ultra would just be way too slow to make cutoffs like he experienced last year. So now we're getting him faster. We still, we still have a ways to go. I, wanna, I would love to get him in the seven minute range so he now has the ability to then apply that to his endurance training that will start a little bit later in the spring as we ramp up for UTMB. I hit the dead end of the trail, so I'm back on tarmac. What's important to mention with, with uh, Zach is that we're going through this speed development based on what he did last year. He got some recovery after last year, but we utilized all of his training that he did last year to allow him to be ready for the speed development. So he's not coming into the speed development just starting off the couch. So in my books, podcasts, other videos, you may have heard speed first and then endurance. This is what I'm talking about. A lot of times to improve our endurance ability, we need to go through speed development, just like pro runners. They go to high school and do cross country and run 3K, 4K, 5K. Then they go to college and do 5K, 10K. Then they graduate and they gradually move to marathon. This is all speed development. They're doing endurance last from a racing perspective. So many of us age groupers are missing out on this speed development. And this is what's gonna catapult, again, what I call your potential, and then apply it to the normal type of endurance building. And so this is particularly the case with veteran runners who maybe have done all the endurance training and need to shock the body and go back to some speed development. If you're just starting out, hey, just running easy and slowly building your volume is gonna be what you wanna do. We don't wanna go right into speed development off the couch. So ask yourself, are you having trouble making cutoff times? Are you having trouble with improving your marathon time? Or is your ultra race not up to where you think it could be? Ask yourself, is your speed fast enough for you to achieve the goal you're looking for with your outcome? If you haven't worked speed, hey, it's a really, really good signal that maybe that's going to be your biggest bang for buck. All right, I'm hitting my turnaround. All right, I burned through two GoPro batteries in a matter of 40 minutes. I think I talked too much at any one time and it didn't allow the hand warmer to warm it up enough for the next one and I burned through it. So I had to finish up my run, come back inside and get the camera and finish up here. So back to Zach. Um, I need to mention that the race he is doing in New Zealand is a 25K. So it's not an ultra. We are using this race to do two things. We are gauging his, how the speed development that we've been doing has taken hold for a little bit of a speed endurance based on the 25K. And secondly, we are really using this to practice race strategy. Since he and I are working together for the first time, it's gonna be paramount that he starts to really, really practice race strategy. And with that, once we get some recovery after this race, he'll need some recovery from travel and the race, we will then look at the, the race data and then decide what to do next. My hunch is that we're gonna then go into some threshold training to improve his strength endurance, taking all the speed development into a little bit more of endurance mode because we do have time to do this and then start the UTM buildup. Again, all based on the, the amount of time we have before the September date of UTMB. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. I'll keep you updated. All right, keep sending the questions. And if you find that uh, I might not be getting to your question, you know, I'm really focused on the people that I know kind of based on their questions and comments that have read my books. And this, is, this channel is really to support them. And if you find, again, that you're, if I'm finding questions that are really rudimentary to what's in the books, I'm probably gonna skip over them because I really wanna support those people that have supported my book. So 
getting the book for $20, $30 is really gonna take your running to the next level and then help you use this supporting content to continue to take your running to the next level. So just for whatever that's worth. And then be a courier, pass it on to someone, be a coach to someone else. Okay, over and out. See ya.